The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash VVY860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, and welcome to New Perspectives in Acute and Chronic GVHD, Challenges and Opportunities for Improving Prophylaxis and Treatment with Novel Therapeutics. My name is Dr. Miguel Perales from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, and I'm pleased to welcome my colleague and friend, Dr. Corey Cutler from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. So the agenda for today's meeting is really to think about GVHD, the management of GVHD, making therapeutic choices for managing acute GVHD and new developments, and then updates in chronic GVHD, present and future management. When we think about acute GVHD, historically we recognize two settings, acute and chronic GVHD. The so-called classic acute, which initially was described as occurring before 100 days, involves three organ systems primarily, the skin, the GI tract, and the liver. And some patients can recur or have persistent uh, acute GVHD and initially, some patients can also have new onset at acute late GVHD at later time points beyond 100 days. And traditionally, chronic GVHD was described as happening after day 100, but we now recognize that this is a biologically different entity from acute GVHD, and it can occur before day 100 also, or can occur later. And this typically involves seven organ systems, including the skin, the mouth, the nails and hair, eyes, lung, musculoskeletal, as well as the GI tract, liver, and other. When patients present with classic chronic GVHD, the question to ask also is, do they have any features of acute GVHD, in which case we talk about overlap syndrome. And if they have no presentations of acute, just chronic alone, then this is what we term classic chronic GVHD. Over the past several decades, we've learned much more about the biology of acute GVHD and chronic GVHD. We understand that there's some continuum in the biology of these two, complications of transplant. And we also understand that many of the underlying mechanisms that stimulate the immune system of the donor to uh, cause acute GVHD. And this has really informed us in terms of potential interventions, both prophylactically, as well as on the treatment side. And this is true both for acute and chronic GVHD. And Dr. Cutler and myself will touch on some of these today. So where did we stand a few years ago, pre-2017, before recent approvals for treatment of both acute and chronic GVHD? Standard prophylaxis is based on a calcineur inhibitor, either tacrolimus or cyclosporin, in combination with a serolimus in some cases for tacrolimus, and more often partnered with methotrexate or MMF. And, and we've also seen the use of uh, post-transplant cyclophosphamide pioneered by the group at Johns Hopkins initially in patients receiving haploidentical grafts and more recently in patients receiving uh, matched grafts or mismatched uh, unrelated donor grafts. Treatment for acute GVHD has really not changed much over the last uh, three decades, I would say, and consists of high-dose steroids. And then for chronic GVHD, similarly, the first line of therapy is often steroids. If the patient is no longer on a calcium inhibitor, we often introduce those drugs as well. And historically, we have used a number of different agents in second line, both for acute and chronic, including pentastatin, uh, etanercept, or infliximab for TNF blockade, serolimus, and a variety of monoclonal antibodies. Um, and we also use uh, other techniques such as extracorporeal uh, photophoresis. So what are some of the acute GVHD targets of prophylaxis and treatment? And you can see here some of the pathways that are involved in recognition and stimulation of T cells and inflammatory responses. You can see the TNF pathway, which can be targeted by tenacept and fliximab, uh, ATG, which uh, targets directly the T cell receptor. Uh, recent data that's very exciting, uh, looking at uh, targeting CTLA4 with a abatacept. Uh, CD52 can be targeted with a lamtuzumab. Uh, we've done studies of Marivaroc, uh, which I'll uh, touch on, as well as uh, targeting IL-6 receptor with tocilizumab and the IL-2 receptor, which is present on activated T cells with ducluzumab and additional antibodies. And then you can see there are additional uh, intracellular pathways, uh, and, and some of those will be touched on today. So what's happening in the world of prophylaxis? Uh, 
This is a study that uh, has been presented by Leslie Key and her group and that uh, is currently being assessed for approval. This is a Batacept uh, for prophylaxis of acute GVHD and unrelated donor transplants. And, and what this study has shown is that a short course of uh, a Batacept uh, four doses seems to prevent acute GVHD without compromising relapse. And you can see in this slide, we're looking on the left at patients who received a seven or eight donor um, and on the right, an eight of eight donor. And you can see that the rates of uh, grade two to four acute GVHD were quite low. Um, and these patients did not receive any ATG in the, uh, in the, um, in the comparator arm. And uh, you can see the graph, uh, the GFS, graph versus disease-free survival and DFS disease-free survival were, were really excellent results um, with low rates of relapse. So this has been given breakthrough designation uh, for the prevention of moderate or severe acute GVHD. Additional studies, uh, this is a, a series of studies that have been performed by the BMTCTN. Uh, Progress One or BMTCTN 1203 has already been published now a couple of years ago is Lancet Hematology. This was a randomized uh, phase two trial with three arms, uh, which were then compared to a control from the CIBMTR. And the intervention arms were uh, post-transplant cyclophosphamide with tacrolimus and Celsept, uh, bortezomib uh, added to tacrolimus and methotrexate, and merivirac added to tacrolimus and methotrexate. And in this uh, study where the primary endpoint was GRIFS or acute GVHD, uh, relapse-free survival, you can see that the, the best arm was in fact the post-transplant cyclophosphamide arm. And this was patients who were receiving a reduced intensity conditioning. And this was designed as a pick the winner study uh, to then move on to a phase three trial, which is currently ongoing. Um, in addition, we have uh, recently completed another uh, phase three trial um, of calcineurin free interventions to prevent uh, graft versus host disease, or PROGRESS-2. This is BMT-CTN 1301, which was co-chaired by Leo Lasnik from Hopkins, Marcelo Pasquini, and myself. And in this study, uh, in recipients of a myeloblative conditioning regimen, uh, patients were randomized to three arms, a bone marrow with tacrolimus methotrexate, the control arm, and then two interventions arms, uh, bone marrow with uh, post-transplant cyclophosphamide and C34 selection of the PBSC graph using the Milteni Clinimax device. Um, this study, as I said, has completed accrual, and I'll be presenting it later at this meeting at the late breaking uh, abstract session. So I invite you to attend that session. And, and what we've seen in the last uh, couple of years is approval of new drugs uh, in both acute and chronic GVHD. And the two pathways that these drugs target uh, are on the left, as you can see, the JAK1, JAK2 uh, pathway, and on the right, the BTK uh, pathway. And you'll hear more about this from myself and from uh, Dr. Cutler. So what has been updated since 2017 is the approval of uh, ruxolitinib, a JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor in patients with steroid refractory GVHD and in chronic GVHD, the approval of ibrutinib, a BTK inhibitor, uh, also in second line. Uh, and so what we've seen is really a, a change, I would say, in the setting of a GVHD with new drugs being approved and you'll also hear from Dr. Cutler about some uh, additional drugs that are likely to see approval soon. So now I will switch to a discussion of uh, steroid refractory acute GVHD in particular. And there's been a number of studies now in this space. Uh, the REACH-1 study was a study that uh, we participated in. This was a uh, single arm phase two trial of patients with steroid refractory acute GVHD. 71 patients were enrolled. Um, and this was standard criteria for defining a uh, steroid refractory acute GVHD. And uh, the dosing of ruxolitinib in this study was initiation at five milligrams uh, twice a day with an increase to 10 milligrams twice a day after three days in the absence of cytopenias. And we had the ability to also uh, modulate the dose of ruxolitinib um, in the case uh, that patients uh, had decrease in their counts. You can see here on the right uh, side of the slide, uh, the safety data um, focusing primarily, I would say, on uh, the myelosuppressive effects of ruxolitinib. That was really the, the limiting toxicity in treatment. Uh, but in many patients, uh, we were able to uh, dose adjust the ruxolitinib back down to uh, five milligrams BID. And in some cases, I've even used uh, five milligrams a day. Um, 
Um, looking at some of the other complications, you can see that infections were common um, and that uh, one of the most common infections was CMV. Um, as you know, in, in patients with a steroid refractory QGBHD receiving a second line therapy, it is very uh, frequent to see uh, infectious complications. And this is looking at uh, the efficacy data from, uh, from ruxolitinib. The day 28 overall response rate was 54.9% uh, with 26.8% uh, uh, CRs and almost 10% uh, VGPRs, uh, as well as 18% uh, partial emissions. And the overall response rate at any time was 73%. Uh, the duration of response at six months um, was with a median of 345 days. And, and you can see here the overall survival and non-relapse mortality. Obviously, patients who responded at day 28, uh, as shown in green, had a much better overall survival uh, and lower non-relapse mortality than the patients who were non-responders in purple, um, shown on these graphs. Um, this was a study that was performed uh, exclusively in the U.S. Um, there was then a, a randomized uh, phase three trial, um, which was performed uh, primarily uh, ex-U.S. Um, and this is um, the study designed for the REACH trial. Um, basically, a uh, phase three trial randomizing patients in second line to either raxolitinib 10 milligrams twice a day or best available therapy and an optional crossover after day 28 was allowed. This study has now been presented as well as published by Robert Zeisser, and, and this was published last year in the New England Journal. And you can see here the, the primary endpoint, uh, similar to what we saw in the REACH-1 st study was the overall response day at day 28. And then they also looked at durable overall responses at day 56. You can see that the, the results from this study were actually not that different from the REACH-1 trial. Um, except that this was obviously randomized. The overall response rate was uh, 62% with almost 28%, uh, um, sorry, with the 34 complete uh, remissions and uh, almost 28% partial responses. And this was significantly better than the overall response rate of just under 40% uh, seen in the controls. And you can see that there is a, a decrease by day 56 but there is still a, a significant uh, benefit uh, to the patients who receive ruxolitinib. Um, some other outcomes from the study, the, the median uh, freedom uh, from failure uh, survival was considerably longer with the ruxolitinib than with control, uh, five months versus one month, and the median overall survival was 11.1 months in the ruxolitinib group and 6.5 months in the control group. Um, so on the basis of uh, these results, uh, raxolitinib uh, is now also approved in Europe for use in um, acute TBHD that has failed the uh, first-line therapy with steroids. And from a safety point of view, again, it's similar to what we saw in the U.S. Phase two trial, uh, mild suppression with primarily thrombocytopenia being one of the issues that we deal with. And we know that thrombocytopenia is present in patients with acute TBHD and this fact uh, uh, can indicate poor prognosis. And again, reminding you that uh, CMV infection is a potential a signal with ruxolitinib as well. And this actually has been seen outside of the, the setting of uh, GVHD. And so now we do have uh, the option to uh, prophylax these patients with latemivir, either in primary or secondary prophylaxis. Uh, and so that I think that should be considered as well uh, as a other standard prophylaxis in patients with steroid uh, refractory GVHD. So as I mentioned, um, one of the issues we need to consider with raxolitinib is dose adjustments based on, on blood count monitoring. And, and uh, as I mentioned, we've reduced to uh, five milligrams twice a day, or in some cases, even five milligrams daily. So where do we stand today in terms of the management of uh, steroid refractory acute GVHD? I think uh, as we manage acute GVHD, uh, a clinical trial should be considered for any line of therapy, including a first-line therapy, and I'll touch on that in a minute. Um, but in the absence of a clinical trial, I think the gold standard today is still steroids. We haven't made any progress over that. Um, in second-line therapy, the FDA-approved drug is now raxolitinib, um, and that's certainly uh, the drug that I would use most uh, commonly in these patients. 
Uh, obviously, certain patients, uh, this may not be an option. Um, we're now seeing some uh, studies where ruxolitinib is being given peritransplant, um, and there's an ongoing study in that setting. Um, or in patients where with poor graft function, we have to with poor graft function, we may need to think about other options. And uh, in patients who've uh, received steroids and then ruxolitinib and have progressed, um, there really is no data uh, for third line therapy at this point. Um, and so again, always consider clinical trial or in the absence of a clinical trial, it's really dealer's choice. And um, I think there's a number of drugs that, that people have tried and, and will try, uh, but nothing is really proven. So uh, turning now to, uh, to Corey Cutler, I'm wondering what your approach is at the FABA in, in patients with acute GVHD and, and what you would do for somebody with steroid refractory. Thanks, Miguel. Uh, so I agree with you entirely that uh, unfortunately, first-line therapy remains steroids, and I would underscore the fact that clinical trials really need to be uh, where we push our patients towards in first line, in second line, and beyond that. The data with ruxolitinib are good, uh, but as you mentioned, the drop-off between day 28 and 56 suggests that we need to do better, and there still is uh, significant treatment-related mortality even with active agents. So we do need to do more, and I think the way to do that is with clinical trials. The only other thing I would add in the management of steroid-resistant disease is our bias uh, against piling on immune suppression in rapid success succession and giving some time for individual agents to work. Uh, I've uh, been very impressed with the fact that the gut simply needs time to recover, and in steroid refractory GI GVHD, uh, when you make a clinical change in therapy, for example, uh, it does take the gut 10 days, two weeks, perhaps even longer to re-epithelialize and to uh, allow responses to be noted. So my only note here is to caution against rapid, uh, rapid piling on of, uh, of immunosuppressive agents because that only leads to trouble. Yeah, I agree. That's a, that's a key point. And I think exploring agents that may help the gut recovery um, as part of the treatment of GVHD, I think is a critical area of research uh, that is sort of an unmet need as well. And I think, you know, those types of agents could be used in combination with the immunosuppressive agents that we're using uh, to try and address the, the underlying problem. Um, but I agree that uh, there is a, a tendency or, or an urgency uh, in some patients who don't seem to be responding to sort of pile on additional immunosuppression, and that often comes at a significant cost of infectious uh, complications. So before we move on to the chronic GVHD, I just want to touch on some of the, the ongoing trials and highlight some drugs that are under investigation. Um, but this is just a sample. I mean, we could give a whole, you know, one hour lecture just on, on new treatments that are currently under investigation. So one study that is being done uh, within the BMTCTN is looking at the, the use of uh, alpha-1 antitrypsine in steroid refractory GVHD. Um, and in a phase two trial, AAT uh, produced a high proportion of durable uh, clinical response in steroid refractory acute GVHD. And this is a drug that seems to be uh, well tolerated and, and have low rates of infectious complications, which would be a, a significant advantage over some of the other approaches that we've had. Uh, and as a result of this, um, there's a now a uh, two studies ongoing, a phase two, three trial that uh, looks at AAT for the prevention of acute GVHD in patients undergoing transplant. And the second trial, which is a study that we're participating in with the BMTCTN, which is looking at uh, first line therapy in patients who have high risk of acute GVHD uh, and patients are being randomized to either steroids alone or steroids plus uh, AAT. And so I think these are the types of uh, studies that uh, may give us a, a change in practice down the road if successful. Um, another drug I thought was interesting and in, in highlighting, and this is work from a, a colleague, Shannon Holton at uh, University of Minnesota, is the identification of uh, human HCG uh, as being a potential agent uh, that can help patients with high-risk acute GVHD. And she recently reported in blood a phase one trial uh, in patients receiving pregnil in addition to standard immune suppression. Uh, 26 patients were uh, treated. Uh, the drug was uh, well tolerated with really no uh, DLTs. And she saw a CR in 62% of patients in the high-risk group. 
and 54% of patients in the second line cohort day 28. So this is obviously a preliminary data um, from a single center, but I think this is uh, something that we may see more data in the future. Um, and then the other area I think which is uh, interesting as well in the, in the management of acute GVHD is the fact that we've uh, sort of moved beyond the classic uh, staging of grades one, two, three, four, and, and tried to sort of uh, uh, bring better clinical uh, stratification to these patients. And we've all recognized that uh, particularly in grade two, uh, there are patients who do very well historically and then patients who do very poorly, and, and there are differences in biology. So there are two systems now that we're using to try and, and stratify patients into standard and high risk. This is the Minnesota system, which is a, a grading-based system and uses the classic uh, grading to differentiate two cohorts of patients, standard risk and high risk. And, and this was published uh, by Macmillan a few years ago in BBMT. And, and you can see that this uh, clinical grading system is actually quite useful. If you look at the left at the day 28 response by uh, risk group, the overall response rate in the patients who had standard risk was 70% with almost 50% CRs. And when you look at the high-risk patients, you can see that that drops to under 50% overall response and only 27% uh, CRs, so almost half. And if you look at the right uh, panel on the slide, you can see that this has real implications in terms of survival as well, with standard risk patients having a 22% risk of mortality at six months. And, and the high-risk patients having double that, so 44% at six months. So this is very high mortality very early on after transplant uh, within six months of diagnosis of, of uh, acute GVHD. And then the other approach was the one pioneered by uh, the MAGIC Consortium. This was uh, the group of John Levine uh, and others originally at uh, Michigan and now at Mount Sinai. And what they've done is, is identify biomarkers in the blood that can help risk stratify patients into standard risk and high risk patients. And this is just an example of one of their early papers in blood, uh, but they've continued to, uh, to pursue identifications of uh, biomarkers. And probably one of the most uh, sensitive and useful ones is uh, ST2, which both uh, that group and, and Sophie Bazneshi, who's now at uh, Musk, uh, have also worked on extensively. And I think with these types of tools, both uh, clinical uh, stratification or biological stratification, we can now design studies where at time of diagnosis, uh, based on, on uh, the risk profile of the patient, either clinical or biological, we can either de-escalate therapy and, and substitute a first-line steroids for other agents, uh, such as was done in the BMT-CTN trial with serolimus, or we can escalate therapy uh, by adding agents uh, to, uh, to the steroids uh, backbone. So I think we're going to see many studies uh, using this type of approach, and hopefully some of them will be successful and help uh, change practice and help change the natural course of, of this disease and this complication. And, and now I'd like to uh, conclude uh, the session of QGVHD and hand over to uh, Corey Cutler for chronic GVHD. Great. Thank you, Miguel. That's really a, a very comprehensive overview of what's going on in the world of acute graft versus host disease. And I will try to cover some of the ongoing issues in chronic GVHD now. And so we'll jump right in to discuss the uh, first drug approved in chronic graft versus host disease. This is, of course, abrutinib. The development of abrutinib was based on the findings that B cells are, in fact, relevant in chronic GVHD. These were findings. Uh, from uh, Dave Miklos and Jerry Ritz, supported by a number of studies using rituximab in chronic graft versus host disease. The natural next step was to look at signaling in the B cell. And as we all know, ibrutinib is an inhibitor of Bruton's tyrosine kinase, which is immediately downstream to the B cell receptor. So we performed a uh, dose finding and phase two study of ibrutinib in chronic graft versus host disease. These were patients who had three or fewer lines of chronic GVHD therapy. And very importantly, they had to have an inflammatory component to their chronic GVHD, which either meant a, an erythematous rash or an active uh, oral involvement. We treated approximately 42 patients, and they were all treated at the 420 milligram dose. Uh, we did a dose de-escalation trial and had no issues with toxicity at the 420 milligram dose. And therefore, that was, in fact, the phase two dose as well. This trial was done a while ago, and the 
primary endpoint was measured according to the 2005 NIH response criteria. These are the results according to the updated data that was presented uh, by Ned Waller at a European meeting and then published in BBMT in 2019. And so here we see that the overall response rate was 69% with uh, 31 subjects having, uh, excuse me, 31% of subjects having a complete response and 38% of subjects having a partial response. Uh, responses were fairly durable in this disease. And there were several things that we learned about the use of abrutinib in chronic graft versus host disease. We learned about the toxicity profile. So the main issues we learned about were the fatigue issues and patients continue to have things like diarrhea and muscle spasms, but also we learned about the uh, atrial fibrillation and other arrhythmia issues. And so we currently don't recommend using abrutinib in patients with uh, underlying structural heart disease or patients with arrhythmias. We also learned a little bit about the dosing of abrutinib with respect to agents that may increase or decrease the uh, exposure of this agent. Most importantly for our practice is the concomitant use of azoles. And so individuals who are taking moderate to uh, uh, strong uh, interacting drugs with the CYP3A system need to have dose reductions in their uh, ibrutinib dose. So for individuals taking voriconazole, we recommend uh, one step reduction down to 280. And for individuals on higher dose posiconazole, uh, down to 140 milligrams per day. Uh, for uh, plain fluconazole, which isn't used a lot in uh, chronic GVHD, uh, no dose changes are actually required. Now, based on the uh, promising results in the uh, steroid refractory setting, uh, the company has actually initiated a trial in uh, steroid naive chronic graft versus host disease, and we have yet to see the major readout of that trial, but we are looking forward to the integrate study, which will be presented uh, hopefully at a European meeting later this year. To move over to the JAK inhibitors, to ruxolitinib, uh, Miguel gave you a very nice background on the use of this agent in acute graft versus host disease, presenting data from the REACH1 and REACH2 studies. And here I'll uh, present the data from the REACH3 trial, which was just presented at ASH in uh, December of 2020, just a few months ago. So this was a European only randomized trial of ruxolitinib versus best available therapy for steroid refractory chronic graft versus host disease in adults and young adults. Uh, these individuals were randomized to either ruxolitinib at a dose of 10 milligrams twice daily uh, in addition to steroids and uh, calcineurin inhibitors, if the patients were already on them, against the best available therapy arm, which included a number of uh, agents, some of which we would consider active in North America, and some of which are just not part of our standard armamentarium in North America, but certainly represented what best available therapy would be uh, in the current setting. And the uh, response, or the primary outcome here, was response at week 24. So here are the data as uh, presented by Dr. Zeiser at ASH, and I believe an update of this will be presented. And here we see very similar to the REACH2 trial that there was a rough doubling of the overall response rate approximately uh, six months after initiating uh, ruxolitinib therapy. So the overall response rate, uh, excuse me, the response rate at week 26 was 49.7% versus 25.6% in the best available therapy. I should mention that the best overall response was significantly higher at, than the 49.7%, but this was the primary endpoint that the investigators chose to uh, design their study around. In terms of secondary endpoints, what we see here in the uh, left panel is a uh, very prominent prolongation of failure-free survival with a failure-free survival that has not yet been reached in terms of median versus the best available therapy which was uh, 5.7 months uh, in terms of failure-free survival. Uh, on the right-hand side are the percentage of patients that are having a response in quality of life according to the Lee symptom score. So not only were there clinical responses, but patients appear to derive benefit based on their self-reporting of quality of life 
Uh, here are some of the toxicity outcomes. Uh, there were significant uh, AEs in this trial. This is, of course, a patient population that has been heavily pretreated, and uh, adverse events, of course, are expected to happen. Uh, there were uh, a significant number of deaths in, the, uh, in both arms, uh, which is a little concerning for a chronic GVHD cohort, but does underscore the fact that chronic GVHD is not just a problem with quality of life, but it is a problem with quantity of life, and there is associated mortality with severe chronic graft versus host disease. There are other JAK inhibitors that are being tested both in acute and chronic graft versus host disease. There are the agents that have a little more JAK1 selectivity, such as itacitinib, which is being tested in acute and chronic GVHD. And this slide uh, discusses baricitinib, which is a little more balanced uh, and was a small study that was presented at ASH uh, just, uh, just a few months ago. In this study, uh, baricitinib had an overall response rate of 65%. However, the best overall response rate was 90%. So it was 65% at six months, uh, but that uh, takes away from patients who might have been responders earlier and then had progressed. Uh, this was, again, apparently very well tolerated, although there was a high incidence of uh, asymptomatic viral infections, most commonly CMV, of course. So what about other pathways that we can explore in chronic graft-versus-host disease? Well, uh, one such pathway is the ROC inhibitor pathway, or the ROC pathway. ROC is a critical regulator of the germinal center uh, with uh, important impacts on STAT3 and STAT5 signaling, where it can downregulate inflammatory Th17 cells and upregulate uh, regulatory T cells. It also is very important as a downstream regulator of fibrosis. So this is a compound that is both being tested in autoimmune diseases as well as fibrosing disease. Based on the uh, very positive results of the KDO25208 study, which uh, will be coming out in JCO shortly, we designed a randomized phase two study of KDO25, the inhibitor of ROC, also known as Belumosidil, for uh, steroid refractory chronic graft versus host disease. This was a trial of approximately 132 subjects who were adults or young adults who had received two to five lines of prior systemic therapy for chronic graft versus host disease. Uh, they were stratified based on the prior exposure to abrutinib or not, but they did not have to have been exposed to abrutinib in the past. This trial was a randomized comparison of 200 milligrams of belumosidil once daily versus 200 milligrams of belumosidil twice daily. Very importantly, uh, in this trial, patients were allowed to be treated until they had clinically significant progression or toxicity. Uh, patients who had mild progression according to NIH criteria were allowed to continue on study. And this was a newer trial, and therefore the primary endpoint was assessed according to the 2014 NIH uh, consensus criteria. And I will present to you here the primary data, which was presented at ASH last year. Uh, we uh, noted an overall response rate of approximately 75%. The two arms behaved uh, very close to each other with 73 versus 77%. And on Monday afternoon, I presented updated data that included organ-specific responses. And I encourage you to look at that abstract. So uh, this is an active agent. This drug has been given uh, breakthrough status by the FDA, and we are expecting a, a decision by the FDA uh, towards the end of May. Uh, this is uh, a little more data on the Rockstar trial, um, but uh, nothing that I haven't said in the uh, prior slides. Now I'll give you a couple of closing thoughts on the management of persistent chronic graft versus host disease. I think one thing that we continue to underutilize is the role of topical and supportive measures in chronic graft versus host disease. We're exceptionally lucky, lucky at our institution to have a really dedicated group of oral medicine specialists, ophthalmologists, dermatologists, and pulmonary physicians who help us manage our patients, and there are a number of things that these subspecialists can uh, offer in terms of the local care or the topical care of these individual organs. Uh, they really cannot be underscored both as topical immunosuppressive and then topical supportive measures 
to reduce the impact of the quality of life decrement when these organs are involved. Another thing to really remember is the fact that our patients are on chronic immunosuppression for long periods of time. And in this setting, the use of prophylactic antifungals is probably very important uh, as patients remain on corticosteroids. In terms of what are our options right now, uh, at the moment, ibrutinib is the, is the only approved agent that is uh, available in second line therapy for steroid refractory chronic graft versus host disease. However, uh, we do believe that both ruxolitinib and belumosidil are going to have approvals in chronic graft versus host disease in 2021. And with that, uh, I think our field is going to really uh, need to pivot and learn to uh, understand how best we should be using these individual agents in the second line setting. So we're going to really need to understand in which patient uh, each individual pathway or agent is the most appropriate. And uh, we are going to have to do some hard studies to try to understand which agents might, might benefit which patients. With that, I'm gonna ask Dr. Perales to comment on what he sees as our biggest challenge in chronic GVHD now that we are going to have three drugs, hopefully approved in the coming months. Yeah, thanks, Corey. I mean, uh, excellent presentation uh, as always. Um, obviously, you know, I think this is exciting time. I mean, just a few years ago, um, we we had no um, new drugs in chronic GVHD or acute GVHD, and, and also we had a few studies. I think uh, historically, um, because of the complexity of these patients the pharmaceutical industry has sort of shied away from exploring uh, drugs in this setting um, because of the risk of, of complications and, and often fatal complications. And we've really seen a change, I think, with, with uh, in the last, uh, you know, half, you know, five to 10 years or so, uh, I think driven in large part by changes at the FDA with, you know, breakthrough designation, orphan drug status and so forth, and the recognition that this, this can be a pathway to approval uh, and we've seen only two drugs approved, uh, as you mentioned, and and likely two additional drugs approved uh, to be approved this year. So now the challenge is, uh, number one, what do we do when we have three drugs approved in chronic GVHD? And, and one of the challenges we're having too is, is how to do all these studies. And, and you know, going from a, a situation where we're knocking on doors to try and get drugs uh, studied that we have to, in some cases, turn away studies uh, because we don't have you know, the bandwidth to do three studies at the same time in the same patient population. And I guess that's a, a good problem to have. Um, I, I think looking at the studies uh, of, of abrutinib and, and ruxolitinib and, and the ROC2 inhibitor in, uh, in chronic GVHD, it, it struck me that the patients who won the abrutinib study um, maybe had, uh, you know, with a type of chronic GVHD patient who maybe had less uh, sclerotic problems and, and maybe more sort of the erythema associated. And I, and I wonder if, if those are the patients who are more likely to respond to brutinib. And I think you clearly showed in, in the Rockstar study that uh, patients with sclerotic uh, disease uh, responded well. Um, so my inclination is maybe to sort of reserve a brutinib, um, you know, for the patients who have that erythema component and, and consider the other two drugs for the patient who have sort of the more uh, sclerotic uh, type uh, chronic GVHD. Uh, obviously, it's it's a moving landscape, and and abrutinib, if successful, may be approved in uh, in first line in addition to steroids uh, in chronic GVHD, and and then that would be the agent of choice there, and then ruxolitinib and and belimosudil, uh, would be in second line. Um, we'll have to see where where the you know where the ruc two inhibitor is actually approved if it's in third line where it was tested or if it's of its broad, and I, I suspect many many physicians will use it earlier than than third line, uh, depending on the patient they're seeing. That, that's that's definitely true. Um, I, I I suspect belumosidil will be approved after failure of two or more lines of therapy, based on the trial indication. Uh, but certainly, uh, as you mentioned, this this uh, embarrassment of riches of agents to use is tricky we are gonna to need to think about combinatorial therapy. So how do we uh, rationally mix and match these agents that may have non-overlapping toxicities and non-overlapping mechanisms of action? 
and then probably even more important than their activity in second and their third line is how do we use these drugs in a prophylactic or preemptive approach and really decrease the overall morbidity and mortality of chronic GVHD by preventing severely morbid diseases. And as we learn more how these agents work in the uh, steroid resistant setting, we're gonna explore how these agents might work as primary prophylaxis of chronic graft versus host disease. As we see more and more use of post-transplant cyclophosphamide, of course, the incidence of chronic GVHD might be going down. That is absolutely a good thing. But for those patients who uh, do develop chronic GVHD after PT psi therapy, perhaps we need an entirely different approach because the mechanism of chronic GVHD development there might be entirely different. Uh, and so uh, we'll need to re-explore other agents like IL-2 uh, and, uh, and other pathways uh, in that setting. No, I agree. And I think the, you know, the post-transplant cyclophosphamide historically has been associated with less acute and chronic GVHD. But I think we need to remind the, the audience that that's uh, primarily data from Hopkins using bone marrow. And, and similar to what we do in, in a modified graphs with standard GVHD prophylaxis, uh, most patients are getting a PBSC graft, not a bone marrow graft. And uh, we know from uh, the CTN trial, one of the earliest trials that was uh, you know, presented uh, by Claudia Nassetti as an ASH plenary and, and published in, uh, in the New England Journal, that the recipients of a matched stimulated donor transplant have less chronic GVHD with bone marrow than with PBSC. And uh, Stephanie Lee uh, published a quality of life uh, follow-up paper to that study, which clearly showed that the patients who got bone marrow uh, in fact, had better quality of life, were more likely to be back to work, for example, than those who got P a PBSC graph. And uh, I, I always remember the, you know, what Dan Weisdorf said a few years ago at a GVHD session, I think uh, probably at the TCT meeting or at the tandem meeting, as it was then known. Um, you know, we can talk about all these drugs uh, to treat uh, chronic GVHD, but the, the best intervention um, is actually to use a bone marrow graph uh, rather than a PBSC graft. And, and that is true for post-transplant cyclophosphamide. There's, there's data published by the CABMTR clearly showing that even with post uh patients who get a bone marrow graft has left, have less chronic GVHD than, than a PBSC graft. So I think that, that remains certainly one of our challenges as well. But I agree that uh, we don't know if the, the chronic GVHD that develops in the post psi setting is exactly the same as sort of the classic chronic GVHD that we've dealt with. And, and, and we need to explore that as well. And, and the combination therapies, I think, you know, we'll have to do uh, in clinical trials because my concern is that people would just sort of throw one drug off to the other. And, and you know, it's, it's unclear, you know, what will we learn from that? I think we need to do this, sort of, as you said, in rationally designed clinical trials. So lots of work ahead of us still, but maybe we pivot it back to a, acute GVHD for a minute or two and talk about how we're going to deal with that. As you've mentioned before, we've done tons of trials in the upfront therapy of acute GVHD, and we've made shockingly little progress, unfortunately. Um, certainly novel acute GVHD prevention regimens are what we need, and it's exciting to see things like Abatacept come around and some of the complicated graph manipulation strategies, the T-cell depletion strategies that are being worked on across the country and in Europe and then uh, the, uh, the FATE protocol, which we'll read out sometime later this year. So it's quite possible we're gonna have major advances in prevention of acute GVHD as well. And at that point, we're gonna need to figure out which of these is the most appropriate to use unless PTSI becomes the dominant uh, regimen that we, that we move to. Yeah, I agree. I think the, obviously the, the post-trans cyclophosphamide question is, is currently open. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned, I'll be presenting, uh, you know, the phase three trial results in patients who received an ablative transplant. And we're currently within the CTN uh, performing progress three, which is a straight up phase three trial uh, in the reduced intensity setting of uh, post sci versus standard of care. And, and either of those studies or both studies could be practice changing when they read out. So we'll have to see if, if post sci becomes a new standard um, in both the ablative and, and reduced intensity setting in recipients of a matched uh, 
uh, related or unrelated donors, um, not just in, in haplidenticorm. Um, I, I think one study that uh, struck me as very interesting was the study performed uh, by the uh, NMDP CIBMTR, which was a mismatched unrelated donor study. And, and that study um, basically was single arm phase two trial uh, in which patients uh, who did not have a uh, fully matched uh, unrelated donor or related donor uh, were treated with post transplant cyclophosphamide, serolimus, and MMF for GVHD prophylaxis. And I thought the, that study was very interesting. Uh, you know, the, we know historically that recipients of a seven of eight uh, graft probably have a 10% worse survival than recipients of an eight of eight graft. And, and the challenge has been to overcome uh, that uh, you know, difference. Um, but we know that that also impacts access to care. And if you look at um, you know, the NMDP, the Unrelated Donor Registry, if you're a white American, you have about a 75% chance of finding a eight, an eight of eight match. But if you're African American, that drops to uh, around 20%. So there's a big difference there in, in terms of uh, donor availability uh, based on race and other minorities, you know, Hispanics, uh, Asian, uh, Pacific uh, Islanders are sort of in between more in the 40% range. Uh, but what we know is that um, given the increasing diversity of the US population, um, we're unlikely to be able to grow the registry uh, to find donors for everybody. Um, and, and there are alternatives, obviously, with, with the use of cold blood and particularly with, with haploidentical transplants. But we and others have shown that not everybody has a, a haploidentical donor available. Um, and so I think if we're now able um, to use a mismatched and related donor, that really opens up uh, possibilities. And, and the MDP has modeled this. Uh, if you can go to a, a seven of eight or even a six of eight, um, then African-American uh, are likely to find a donor in up to 80%. Uh, white patients will find a donor in, in, in almost uh, over 90% of cases in the registry. So this would really be a, a paradigm shift if we could safely use a mismatched donor. And I think what the, what the study showed, uh, the mismatch unrelated donor study showed with post-transplant cyclophosphamide, you know, a very good uh, survival at one year uh, and what was striking is that um, almost half the patients on the study were minorities. And, and there's very few clinical trials uh, done in, uh, in transplant or other areas that have such a high representation of minority patients. So I think it really speaks to, to what that uh, could represent. And obviously, now we have to figure out what the follow-up study is to that um, to sort of confirm those results. Right. Um, I think in the upfront uh, acute GVHD setting, um, you know, I mentioned the alpha-1 antitrypsin study that's ongoing, but that has been an area that we've struggled. And, um, you know, I'm thinking back to uh, some of the studies that have been done there. We, 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 uh, you know, we see Stephanie Lee's old study of the Clusimab, which targets the IL-2 receptor, uh, which looked promising in, in steroid refractory GVHD in the study that was done at uh, Memorial and, and MD Anderson uh, when you and I were probably in high school. Um, and then Stephanie went on to do this randomized phase three trial, and the study was stopped early because of increased relapse uh, associated with Ducluzumab. So, you know, shutting down immune responses too much uh, led to, to more relapse. Uh, the CTN then did a study of MMF um, in the upfront setting in addition to steroids, and that was based on another one of these uh, pick the winner randomized uh, trials, which in that case actually had four arms. Uh, MMF, um, to the surprise of many of us, I think, was, was the winner in that trial, uh, which included a pentastatin, uh, ONTAC, and uh, etanercept as the other arms. Uh, and then when we went to phase three trial in the CTN, uh, that study was stopped only for futility. Basically, uh, MMF was not doing anything. And, and more recently, although it hasn't been uh, presented yet, uh, we've seen that uh, Insight pulled the plug on there. Uh, upfront study of uh, itacitinib, um, you know, in addition to steroids, that's the JAK1 inhibitor, um, because that study was going to end up uh, as, again with no with no signal, another futility uh, trial. Um, so I think you know the upfront setting um, has been challenging. Um, we all recognize that steroid refractory GVHD is is not a good place to be uh, 
Um, and so trying to improve the upfront treatment uh, is critical, uh, but so far track record hasn't been that good. Um, I think the other setting that we're all interested in exploring is, is sort of trying to identify patients, uh, early post-transplants who are at risk for GVHD, potentially using biomarkers um, and, and doing sort of preemptive therapy for GVHD. And, and I'm wondering what your thoughts on, on that approach. Well, I think in order to, to take a preemptive approach, one really needs to have um, good or actually great biomarkers because you're talking about adding immunosuppressive therapy for some patients who are not eventually going to require it. My opinion right now, the positive predictive values and the negative predictive values of our current biomarker panels don't uh, necessarily support uh, heavy interventions in the preemptive space in acute graft versus host disease. I certainly think we need to work on the magic criteria to see if they can be expanded and, and will perform a little bit better. But in my opinion, they're not quite there uh, just quite yet, but I agree. The uh, Europeans under uh, Andrea Bacigalupo have, have tried this in the past without really showing that preemptive approaches lead to uh, improved outcomes. Uh, the biomarker panels there were a little bit less sophisticated than what uh, we're doing now with MAGIC, but I agree uh, trying to pick up on acute GVHD before, before it's a real problem, before it becomes steroid dependent or steroid refractory is really the way of the future. Uh, just to go back to the NMDP, uh, they are doing a follow-on study uh, of the uh, mismatched unrelated uh, patients. So they're going to have a, a three cohort study looking at an ablative group, a reduced intensity group, and actually a pediatric group, which is very important because as you know, the abatisep studies were done almost entirely uh, in, uh, in pediatric transplantation. And so we do need to really define the role of uh, seven of eight or six of eight transplant in uh, underrepresented minorities. Uh, we're at the point now where just about everybody, if we can get a six of eight or seven of eight, will have a graft. I think uh, we need to think about cord blood once again, particularly with the positive results of the NICORD study, which uh, are going to allow patients to, uh, to really have uh, access to high quality, uh, well-matched individual cord units. And uh, I believe we'll hear more about that from uh, Mitch Horowitz at this meeting. So I think we are, we're entering a, a state where everyone will soon have, there'll be a donor for just about everybody but uh, we do need to continue to work on GVHD. I agree. Thank you, Corey, for, for a great discussion and great presentation today. I, I hope uh, this was uh, helpful to the audience. And, uh, uh, and with that, thank you and, and have a great meeting. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash VVY860. This activity is supported by educational grants from CSL Bearing, Insight Corporation, and Pharmacyclics LLC, an AbbVie company, and Janssen Biotech Incorporated, administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs LLC.